um, I'm uh, honored to be among the visionaries in this conference, especially since I graduated here in uh, 1983, as Alistair said, 30 years ago. And um, at that time, computer science was a much, uh, theoretical computer science was a much smaller field. And this is actually a foreword from, uh, I think, uh, Fox 1983. And if you see, there's eight people on the committee. And among them, there is uh, Dick Karp and, Rich and uh, Christos of the Mitru. And I, I'm told that for the conference that's going to uh, take place in San Francisco in a few days, there's more than 60 committee members, so the field has grown quite a bit. Uh, but uh, when I came here, I, I didn't realize that the field was just really in its infancy. And uh, I thought that uh, you know, my uh, professors then, there were these grand old men. I don't know if you recognize them. There's a big cup up there. And uh, these are just a few of the photos that <coughs> I have. And I didn't realize that I was act they were actually younger than I am right now, which is kind of a daunting. Uh, realization. Um, and this is a uh, Nathan Lawler. Um, okay, so uh, in these 30 years, essentially since 1983, uh, really computer science obviously has had a remarkable journey, and uh, so has theoretical computer science. You know, every decade has its uh, theories um, and its uh, you know, incredible results. I think that at that time we didn't know that linear programming was in P, primality is in P. Uh, there's these theories of learning and interactive proofs and hardness of approximation, list decoding, uh, property testing. There's lots and lots of theories, and I'm only mentioning the ones that I'm more familiar with and that have happened in these last 30 years. Theories, results, and they've had impact, as we heard yesterday, on, um, on technology. So uh, uh, um, I think in the introduction of uh, John Kleinberg, who's mentioned his uh, work on um, web search, and then on science, um, the physicist from uh, Caltech is telling us about how uh, seeing Shor's uh, factoring uh, on quantum computer has really motivated his own research to go in that direction in biology, in the work of Hausler. So much so that Berkeley, right, I think, uh, has coined the term, you patented, the computational lens of theoretical um, computer science or, or, or computation on science and engineering. But today, I'm actually going to talk about a different lens. And um, that's the cryptographic lens. So I want to sort of view developments in uh, theoretical computer science in the last 30 years, even though I only have an hour, uh, through this lens and um, of a cryptographer. Uh, and uh, it, since uh, theoretical computer science can shed light on science and technology, you know, uh, by transitivity there, we will see also the effect of this cryptographic view on uh, science and technology. So before I start talking about the next 30 years, um, I just want to sort of go back for a minute and say that even historically, uh, sort of two giants of, uh, they have Claude Shannon and Alan Turing are uh, well known as being, doing fundamental work in cryptography. So Claude Shannon, at the time that he was coming up with his theory of information theory, also came up with the theory of secrecy. Uh, so there are these two papers, Mathematical Theory of Communication and Communication Theory of Secrecy System, and they appeared around the same time, but apparently his work on uh, secrecy system was classified for about five years before they let him, um, let him uh, um, publish it. And uh, by his own testimony, saying that he's inseparable, sort of the ideas that came up in both of these work were inseparable, for, and uh, the motivation went back and forth. And as far as Turing is concerned, we know he's the inventor of uh, what we call modern computability theory. And he's probably, to the public at large, more known as the breaker of the Enigma machine. Now, what's in common among those two guys? One is information theory. The other one is talking about computa computability theory. What's common is both of their research in cryptography uh, it was really wartime research, right? So it's motivated by World War II, by either defining what a perfect secrecy would be or trying to break a system that's not perfectly secret. In fact, I think I read in the Wikipedia that they met in 1943 because of the war effort. Um, and this is where I want to depart. So their work is motivated by, you know, trying to protect communication during wartime. But modern cryptography, which is sort of the beginning of my talk, is not about, it was not uh, a, a result of wartime effort. It was actually come about with sort of realization that we have this amazing digital age coming about and amazing ability to communicate. And there is some prospect here for uh, the economic development and so forth. And the new cryptography uh, needs to be, to be invented to harvest it. So um, to quote Silvio, <laughs> cryptography is not about fighting the bad guys, uh, or at least in my I add, it's not just about fighting the bad guys. And, um, but I would like to think of cryptography, I'd like you to think about cryptography, as a theory that's concerned with the correctness and privacy of information. And today, 
the th correctness is as important as the privacy of information in the cryptographic effort. So there the, I sort of put three bullets which kind of uh, will uh, be the thread for my talk. First of all, cryptography has really enabled us to do fairly um, kind of surprising abilities uh, with digital information, which often when you hear about it, they will seem paradoxical in the physical world. And I'll talk about a few of those. Uh, second of all, which is more of the cryptographic lens on the rest of theoretical computer science, is that it has been a catalyst to a lot of notions and techniques that I think have led, it's fair to say that have led to some intellectual leaps in theoretical computer science. And finally, I believe that going forward in the future, it is really our uh, a hope uh, to enable taking advantage of all this enormous uh, data availability that we have and connectivity uh, while still maintaining sort of what we call civil liberties and economic stability. Uh, in, uh, I'll give you some hint of why I believe this uh, toward the end of my talk. Okay, so cryptography is also a field that has done pretty well advertising itself. So these, I think the first bullet, which is these surprising abilities, are probably more familiar than anything else I will be talking about in this talk. But so let me just flash the slide up without going through it. But what do I mean by surprising ability? Surprising ability includes the ability to communicate privately in every meeting in public cryptography, the ability to somehow exchange simultaneously, to sign a contract, even though we're in remote parts of the country, and to believe that it happens simultaneously. It in includes being able to prove a theorem without actually letting you look at the proof, uh, generating ra uh, pseudo-random numbers that look like random numbers for any purpose that you may desire, and, um, and other um, things like playing any digital game among a party sitting all around the internet without any referees, without any deck of cards, uh, computing on encrypted data, and so forth. So there are these, if you think about these, each one, often it seems like you can't, you can't do it, but you can. Uh, so what is the unifying theme among all this? They seem very, very different, you know? Playing games, exchanging information, sort of randomness, proving theorems. So the unifying theme in throughout all of this cryptographic development is the presence of the adversary. That's this guy over here, and not the artist, but I have direct access to the artist. So, um, so the unifying thing, the artist is amazing. Uh, <laughs> so um, that's near. So in any case, um, the unifying theme is that uh, we have an adversary. Now, you know, when I took Introduction to Algorithms, my first course, we talked about analysis of algorithms, like analysis of a sorting algorithm. We talked about an adversarially chosen input. It's not that I haven't seen the word adversary before, but that was for the analysis of the algorithm. Whereas in cryptography, the, uh, the uh, adversary is really an integral part of the definition of the problem. So let's say in a communication system, if there's nobody listening, there's really no problem. Uh, in a proof, uh, if the prover is all, you believe the claim, there's no point in actually getting convinced about it. If we think about the proof as an adversary who's trying to convince me of the correctness of a statement but actually has a bug, and so forth. So it's an integral part of the definition of the problem, and in addition to that, it will determine the quality of what I mean by an acceptable solution. So in the case, let's say, of random numbers or pseudo-random numbers, if they look random to the adversary, they are as good as anyone might, may want. So he both is there to define the problem and to de determine what's acceptable or not. And I would say that actually, if you think about any kind of complex system where there's a lot of moving parts and we don't know how to analyze it, the only way we should be analyzing it is by thinking that there's an adversary out there trying to ruin the system, okay, and we need to show that the system works even in the presence of this adversary. Otherwise, it's not really clear how to start analyzing what could go wrong. So what's the power of this adversary? That's going to be very important. So we will, since uh, often in cryptography or in the other applications I'm talking about, the adversary comes into play after the system has been designed, it will make no sense to assume in advance that he has some sort of restricted strategy. So he has an adaptive strategy, and we will really just assume that we have no idea what his strategy is. And moreover, that doesn't mean that he's a, we think of him as a random adversary, but he will be a worst case. So his worst case, we have no assumptions about how he behaves, but we do make one assumption. And that is this adversary does not have unbounded amount of time. So he's computationally bounded. Now, usually that will be polynomial time, but for depending on your application, you could define that more restricted or less restricted, but he's computationally bounded. Now, making this adversary computationally bounded means that uh, two things. First of all, I claim it's realistic. So if we, cannot, if we cannot do something in the lifetime of the universe, that is good enough for me. And second of all, uh, it's going to give us great power. So it's going to enlarge, essentially, the range of applications and things that we can do. You know, from an impossibility to a possibility and actually even, even uh, utilization. 
Okay, so what are, uh, let me, before we start talking about specific things, what are sort of two, you know, axi axioms or sort of axiomatic uh, notions that we use in cryptography? One of them is what we call computational indistinguishability or what you could call effective similarity. So we say that if the adversary, let's say there are two probability distributions, those on the, on the right here, and you can think of these as distributions on k-bit strings, distribution one and distribution two. And say the adversary can press a button and get a sample either from distribution one or from distribution two, but he no, doesn't know which, and that happened, let's say, during, by a toss of a coin, he has no, I, no way to distinguish which it is. So when he sees the sample, it may have come from D1, it may have come from D2, he cannot distinguish it with better than a you know, negligible probability, one in exponential in k, one in two to the k, if you think of it this way. And that, uh, in cryptography, if that's the case, we will say that as far as we're concerned, he, they are the same. So from the point of view of the adversary, those two probability distributions are the same. And we've applied this point of view of indistinguishability of probability distributions to the problem of encryption, sort of random number generation, even simultaneity. So after all, two people doing something in two parts of the country are not doing it simultaneity. But effectively, it's going to look as if it is simultane simultaneous. We will not be able to distinguish the simultaneous from the non-simultaneous. And also can apply this to this question of correctness of proofs, not being able to distinguish between a correct proof and a proof that has a bug because there will be such a small probability of, of, of that coming up. Um, I'm just glad you're laughing. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Let's talk about it later. Okay. We'll get to it. Okay? It's actually not the kind of proof I'll talk about in this lecture, but there is another notion that people have gone in that direction, which is an interesting philosophical point of view. But uh, let's continue. Uh, um, right. So another thing that this enables me is to do manipulations on probability distributions. So if two are in computation distinguishable, and the second from the third, and so forth, we can sort of step through the steps of probability distributions and reach more and more interesting uh, conclusions. So just to make it a little bit more uh, precise, not precise, uh, to exemplify it, so what would be these probability distributions? So in the case of encryption, you could think of one distribution as the encryption of message M0, and the other distribution is the encryption of message M1. Actually, these two sets have nothing in common. They have no common support. But but if we, the adversary cannot tell them apart, so as far as he can tell, when he sees the encryption of M0, encryption of M1, they look in, indistinguishable to him, we will say, uh, and we will show that then such an encryption scheme will hide all partial information. Uh, another example of where this computational distinguishability definition comes into play is when you talk about randomness. So here set one is totally random k-bit strings, or let's say exponentially long strings, and uh, the pseudorandom is, uh, you know, they're not random. Actually, they were generated by the deterministic program, starting from a very little bit of randomness. We say, if the adversary can't tell this apart, say he has an exponentially long string and he has random access into the string, uh, then they are as good as random. Because in any application you may use, which works in effective time, you will not be able to witness any difference, since that's how we define the computational indistinguishability. Um, so, in fact, uh, such pseudorandom number generator is, generation is possible. So what's the second axiom? I said there are two that I would say that they are sort of axiomatic notions. And that is, so in the definition I just show, showed you, the adversary was sitting on the outside, right? And he was looking at these two, somebody was presenting him a sample, and he was making a verdict, random, pseudorandom, encryption of M0, encryption of M1. But in some of the applications we'll think of, or some of the cryptographic work, the adversary is actually part of the system. So he's not, he's not really getting a sample from the outside and looking at it, but he's actually part of creating this sample. In that case, what we will say is that essentially, if this insider view, so the adversary here is talking to Alice here or, or whoever her name is, uh, so if the, the, uh, the adversary uh, is an insider and he's generating this conversation, let's say they're sending messages back and forth, they're tossing coins, if in fact this conversation is indistinguishable again from something that could have been simulated in the laboratory by that same adversary. He could have sort of simulated interactions that he's actually participating in, in in the real world. If these two interactions are indistinguishable from each other, again, we would say that having participated in it has given him nothing extra, or what we call zero knowledge, and that will be summarized by, if you can simulate, you might as well stay at home. Okay, so these are these two, uh, is it, these are these two um, kind of axiomatic uh, notions. Now, in my 
my title of the talk is that cryptographic lens. So what are these developments that I am alluding to in theoretical computer science that come from these cryptographic results? So I've listed a few of them. First of all, there's sort of the more celebrated one, I'll talk about it, is this uh, zero knowledge proof leading to probabilistic proof systems, hardness approximation, all the way till actually some extremely interesting work by Umesh and et al on quantum interactive experiments, which I'll discuss. So this is a very famous one. Uh, we have the development of pseudo-random functions and generators, which has uh, led to examples of concepts which are unlearnable. That already goes back to work for Valiant and Kearns in, in 1983, and then more recently of Russ Borf and Rudish about showing impossibility of lower bounds by what they call natural proofs. Uh, we have this early proof of security or of a hardcore bit by Goldrach and Levin, which is really the first list decoding algorithm for um, Hadamard codes, and which has led to a, a really a, a, a burst of developments on list decoding algorithms, read, uh, you know, the read, uh, Mueller co read Salmon codes, and up to uh, this result in 2005 of, of Goswami, and uh, showing explicit codes which actually achieve uh, linear, um, achieve the list decoding bound. So this is really a big result, okay, in coding theory. This is a, a, a huge development in coding theory, but I. I claim, and I think this is, uh, has been checked with all the coding theorists in question, that this has started really from this original proof of trying to show that some, uh, something was hard cryptographically, and the proof itself turned into an algorithm, uh, a list decoding algorithm. Uh, another development uh, which is much more active these days is the development on, lo on locally decodable codes. So very early days, I think that uh, Actually, Michael Rabin was visiting Manuel Blum here at Berkeley, and he came up with this idea of oblivious transfer. The idea somehow I can transfer you information, and now I don't know what I'm transferring. Sounds like a bizarre activity, but turns out to be very fundamental. And in any case, that has led to something called private information retrieval, and in turn, to algorithms on locally decodable codes. What does that mean? That's a code. Okay, so you take a message and you uh, encode it for error correcting code such that you can recover, you know, let's say the ith bit of the original message only by looking at a few bits rather than having to look at the entire code word. And, you know, very important to our applications, very strong results at this point. I can keep going going. Let me just do the last one. And that is that often it's not the notions, but it's the techniques okay, that have been very useful. So say techniques for proving average case hardness usually work this way. You want to map any worst case instance to an average case instance. And what that means really is that there are no worst case instances. Everything, you know, is a, is a, is an, is a hard instance. Every average instance is hard. But the technique really shows you how to take uh, any problem and map it uh, to some a random sample uh, in, in, a way, in a sense. And in fact, as, has a direct link to property testing of the day where instead of looking at an entire input, you can sort of sample it at places and make conclusions from these, global, from these local checks about a global property. And I haven't mentioned here, you know, the, the work on number theory, which came from uh, apparently uh, people trying to break RSA in quantum or other ways, uh, which has been very inspirational as a motivation to work on these problems. So of course, I'm not gonna talk about all of these. Uh, I will talk about that left thread Essentially, mostly because it's going to bring me up to current day research. Okay, so I, I said, don't tell me what time it is, but tell me what time it is. It's, uh, you have 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, well, this is where my stock talk starts, really, but I can speak faster. Okay, so, so we're going to talk about um, zero knowledge proofs and sort of how, where they are today. Uh, so, well, we're talking about proofs. Okay, so proofs. You know, we're so obsessed with originality and uh, the creative process and, and these grand old provers that we forget, we have forgotten often in mathematics, that there's actually somebody else there, and that's uh, the verifier. So the prover here uh, is one party, but we're going to focus on how hard it is to verify this illustrious, uh, what did Maria say, 100 pages, 250 pages? Uh, so we're going to focus on how difficult it is to verify um, a proof. And we will focus on it from a computational point of view. So this verifier is going to, let's say that he works in polynomial time in the claim size. That's as much time that he has to check whatever proof you provide him. So the canonical proof is, let's look at an example. Let's say there's some equation, and the, 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 the prover says, listen, uh, uh, I, have, I have solved this equation. And that's, it's a difficult equation to solve. We're not going to worry at all how much time the prover takes. He's infinitely powerful, and he does not concern me. All concerns me is how much time it takes to check the proof. 
you know, we, will we could bring this down to Earth, but this is a theory, visions, and from what I've seen yesterday, we don't have to be down on Earth. We could be flying with ducks in the air. So, so, um, so uh, we care about Verifier here, or Bob. Uh, and uh, how does she convince him she can solve the equation? She gives him a solution. It's very simple, right? She says x1 is equal to 0, or x2 is equal to 1, and so forth. And that's trivial. Then he can plug it into the equation, checks, it works out. He says, I accept. You have convinced me. Now, what has happened here is that uh, after the interaction, Bob, he believes the equation is satisfiable or because he got the solution, but he actually knows also a particular solution. This equation may have many solutions. He knows now one which he did not know before. And the question is, and that makes sense, right? All proofs are like that. You write them in a book. Now well, you, I can prove to you, and assuming that you, are, uh, you can understand my handwriting, you can prove to someone else, and so forth, OK? But the question is, from a cryptographic point of view, uh, that's really, we don't want to give more than we should. So is there any other way? Can I convince you in any other way but giving you the solution to the equation? And there is. And, um, and essentially, the, if we had to have a caption, we would say, I'm not going to give you the solution, but I will prove to you that I wanted, if I wanted to, I could. Okay? So I'm going to convince you I could give it to you, but I'm not giving it to you. Okay, so how does that play out in the case of the equations? Um, uh, so first of all, how am I going to do this? We're going to have it deviate from the idea of a, the classical prover writing a textbook. We're going to need coin tossing, and we're going to need interaction between the pr prover has to be present. In order to convince me of that, we're going to have to talk back and forth, and at the end I will believe, but I will not know the solution to the equation. So this is the only technical slide in the talk, okay? The yes. I was especially vague. The equation is just, it's a, 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 here is a particular equation. Okay, let's look at a particular equation. Uh, but I, what I meant by an equation is just to say that any proof I can think of it is that you tell me what the length of the proof is. It's every bit in it you can think of as a variable. And, uh, you know, essentially an assignment to those variables is an instantiation of the proof, the classical proof. Okay? But let's look at a particular equation to see this example. So the particular equation is that the prover, what? Integers. Now they are integers. So uh, the particular equation is that he wants to convince you that y is equal to x squared. Okay, very simple equation, mod n, where n is a hard, is a number, and uh, if then n is a number which is hard to factor for the verifier, this is a difficult equation to solve. It's as difficult actually as factoring n. But this prover is all powerful. You know, this Alice, she's something, and she has proved she has uh, solved this equation. Now she wants to tell Bob the solution, but she doesn't really. I mean, she wants to tell him that she could tell him the solution. How could she do that? Now, this uh, system is really very typical of any zero-knowledge proof. The idea is the following. She will pick a random number there. Did you see that flip? It's uh, quite something. Uh, flip. Yes. OK. So she flips a random number r. And using this r, she comes up with two equations. One equation is uh, r squared mod n. The second equation is the original y times r squared mod n. So now there are these two random equations. Each one on its own is completely random, has nothing to do with the original equation. However, if you saw solutions for both of them, so you knew r and you knew a, a square root of, uh, of z and a square root of z times y, of course you can construct the square root of the original equation. The thing is that she's not going to give him the solution to both equations. She says, look, here's z and a z times y. I could solve both of them, but I'm not going to, because I don't want to give you the entire proof. You choose which one. It's up to you. Obviously, if she can solve both, no matter which one he's going to ask for, she can answer. But if she cannot solve both, okay, she can solve one or the other, then uh, he might, if he asks the wrong one, she doesn't know how to solve, he will catch her with mistake. So the Bob here, you know, he's confused. He says, what am I going to do? How am I going to figure this out? And uh, we say, best strategy is choose at random. It's the best you can do. Flip a coin, ask her for either to solve one or two, and see if she succeeds. And in fact, if she... Um, he will accept the claim that the first equation is solvable if and only if she's able to, so to answer his question. So note what happened here. I claim that if, in fact, Alice, this equation was solvable, Alice can answer every equation. 100% of the time, she can answer his questions. But if the equation was not solvable, then the probability he's going to catch her based on his coins, she has nothing to do with it, is greater or equal than a half. Because with a half probability, he will land on the equation she cannot solve. So in a sense, what are we doing here? We're saying that he can prove a correct theorem, and he can 
get away and he can, will be caught in proving an incorrect theorem with probability half. Not a very good probability, but if we repeat this, we can make it exponentially small. Just do this again and again until it disappears, okay? Now, why, why did we do such an effort? I mean, wasn't it easier for Prover just to give Alice the solution to the equation? Because, essentially, one minus. One minus. Yes, one minus, thank you. Otherwise, not too good. Uh, <laughs> um, why did we do all this? Because at the end, Alice should be convinced, uh, Bob should be convinced with a really overwhelming probability that she didn't cheat him, but what has he gotten? He's gotten solutions to random equations. Completely useless, could have generated it on his own in the laboratory and stayed home, didn't have to go talk to Alice. Okay, he did have to talk to her, right? Because she actually did convince him of something, but nothing else. So this is really uh, what's, what's, a zero, what's called a zero-knowledge interactive proof. And as you said, we are changing here the notion. When I say proof, you know, when I, used, when I did say this 30 years ago, people in the math department would like be willing to stone us, but now less so uh, with all the prizes and everything. Um, uh, no, but seriously speaking, we don't call it a proof, we call it interactive proof, okay? So we're saying it's a process of convincing a distrustful adversary that has both completeness and soundness. If it's correct, I will convince you. If it's incorrect, you, I will not convince you. So with overwhelming probability, you will catch me. And, in and then ultimately, we're saying that's what any proof should be, okay? In addition, it has the zero-knowledge feature. Um, and the zero-knowledge feature has been you know, extremely useful. I will not talk about that here. Mostly due to a generality, its generality, a theorem proved by Goldreich, Michaeli, and Wigderson, showing that the example I gave, which used no assumptions or anything, can actually be true about any language, any classical proof can be turned into a zero-knowledge proof if in addition you want to be willing to assume that one-way functions exist. So I thought I'd heard everything about zero-knowledge, but then Boaz gave this talk. Uh, did you see this down here? Zero knowledge and nuclear disarmament. Amazingly enough, there's a paper by Boaz Barak with uh, uh, Glasser and Golson, two physicists in Princeton, which have used the concept of zero knowledge to come up with a scheme how you can dis, uh, disarm a nuclear warhead without actually looking at its design. And it's, it's kind of fascinating because I can actually understand that paper. I mean, I don't understand the physics, but the method is very similar to what we do for digital information. Okay. What is this a catalyst for? So this is really well known, you know, and uh, in some sense it's like, I hope there's some people here that haven't seen it before, but uh, what has this been a catalyst for? So it has been, if you think about it, the catalytic understanding here is that you can decouple the correctness of the proof from actually the knowledge, uh, the, checking the correctness from the knowledge of the proof, that these are not synonym to each other, okay? And once you make that decoupling, it really means that you can start asking new questions. It says, ah, if that's the case, I can ask new questions about the nature of a proof. It could be like, maybe I can prove harder statements than I could originally. Maybe I could prove things more efficiently. Maybe there are other proof systems altogether that I could look at. If it's not about writing in a book, other systems may make sense. And in fact, these are the kind of questions that have been asked and actually answered in the last 25 years leading up to some current research on cloud computing. Okay, so here is, we continue. Um, so can we in fact prove more than we could from a classical proof? So that equation, and now I hope that you understand, so in some sense you think of these variables as Boolean, uh, we can definitely convince a verifier it's satisfied just by giving him the assignment to the variables. But how about this? Can we do things like uh, convincing that there are no assignments? How do we do that? I mean, he, we can't cycle through all of them. That will take too much time. Can we convince him, that's the Cohen P class, can we convince him that there are actually exactly two to the 100 minus 13 solutions? Again, it seems like a, a tremendously more difficult a, a thing to do, or can we even convince him something with alternation of quantifiers? P space, I won't get into what that means. So classically, we don't know how to do that, but with an interactive proof, it came as a really a fantastic surprise when Fortnow, Karloff, Lund, and Nissan, and then followed by Shamir, showed you can. So using this mechanism of the verifier tossing a coins, going back and forth, okay, even forget the zero knowledge, just we want to prove these statements, it is possible to prove p-space type of equation. That is, I can show you that there's zero solution, exact number of solution, and it's actually exactly equal. What you can prove through this interactive mechanism is what uh, is in p-space. Now, um, great. That seems like a very good story and a good place to stop. However, we're not satisfied. 
I mean, in general, we are dissatisfied a lot, I think. But in any case, because um, all these adversaries roaming around. But uh, the next kind of natural question, is there another way to prove theorems? Okay, so we've got this interaction. It's gotten us very far. What else can be done? And this is, uh, here is another model, uh, together with uh, Avi and Mickey Benor and Joe Killian, when I was visiting, actually, sabbatical in, in, in Israel. And the question is, okay, you know what? What can we do? what we would like to do. So remember I had that zero-knowledge theorem, which if one-way functions exist, that everything is in zero-knowledge. So we don't like this assumption if one-way function exists. So say, is there some other way you can be convinced of a statement where you, in zero-knowledge, making no assumptions whatsoever? So we're saying, how about adding another prover? Now, that seems ridiculous, right? The prover is infinitely powerful. I never put any restriction on him. Why is it going to help to have two infinitely powerful provers? I mean, two, one, what difference does it make? The point is going to be that they don't talk to each other. So this is very much like those people who like to see law and order. Um, you know, those investigators, they, they love it when they have two suspects, not then one, right? Because when they have two suspects, they put them in a room, they ask them tricky questions, and then bam, they catch an inconsistency, okay? So these two provers are gonna be sitting in different rooms, the verifier is gonna interrogate them, and the hope is that if they deviate, he can check them by being inconsistent. It turns out that this is the next sort of catalytic uh, sort of kind of leap, that uh, by checking consistency is incredibly powerful. So why is it so powerful? Uh, so first of all, we, can, we showed, in fact, that you don't need assumptions. You could do zero knowledge perfectly, unconditionally for anything in NP. So two people closed in a room, because they have to be careful not to be caught, they will tell you the information in such a way that you can verify it, and they have really given you, you know, uh, zero knowledge, okay, even without any assumptions. But even more fascinating than that, a Babai, Lord Portnow, and Lund, very quickly after that IP equal to P space result, have shown that the two provers are more powerful, it seemingly, than one. So not only that they, they can actually convince this poor polynomial time verifier of non-deterministic exponential time statements. So we went from NP classically to non-deterministic exponential time with these two guys. Somehow, this an ability to to check whether two, proofs are two provers are consistent gives you incredible power. And uh, where, here's an example kind of to explain that. So let's say there's a system of equations. So these are uh, Boolean equations, so these are equations over GF2, uh, linear equations, and uh, they're not, you, there is no assignment that satisfies all of them, okay? Because if there was, we could find it by Gaussian elimination. But uh, it turns out to be a very difficult problem to tell whether, let's say, 99% of these equations are satisfied or, more, or, or just 51%. So, and um, if you had a single prover, what do you do? He claimed more than 99%. You say, OK, give me the solution to the equation. I check it. It's more than 99%. I'm happy. Okay? But it's a lot of communication. You have to give me the solution to all of the equations. If you have two, okay, here's another strategy. Um, essentially, the verifier chooses a random equation, one of the many equations. Okay, he sends that equation to one prover. He says, hey, give me the assignment to those three variables. Then he chooses one of those three variables, either x1, x4, or x7 at random, let's say x7, sends it to the other prover. And he says, hey, what's x7? Now, if in fact there was a solution that satisfied 99% of the equations, no problem. They just answer according to that solution. But if there isn't one, okay, when I ask the second guy for x7, should he say zero? Should he say one? Zero satisfies some equations. One satisfies another equation. He, he better tell me the best he can. And if the best he can is less than this 99% or let's say like 51%, then I will catch him. So this is just an intuition why this enables me to reduce communication dramatically. Because originally they had to give me a solution to everything. Now I've asked them really for four bits of information, three bits from one, the assignment to those three variables, one bit from the other. And this ca has, can be proved really to work, so it's not just a toy example. So, uh, Johan Hastad, you have to, un I have an algorithm why, whose pictures show up. So at the end of the talk, I have a quiz. Uh, if you have other, no other questions, you can answer that one. Uh, so in any case, Johan Hastad um, showed that this, in fact, is a, a two-prover interactive proof with good soundness and good completeness. You can prove correct theorems. You cannot prove incorrect uh, theorems. Um, and this has uh, led to really, if you think about it, the crux of that idea, is what underlies the, the PCP theorem. It says that any theorem in NP can be proved by looking at a constant number, getting a constant number of bits from these two provers and checking a consistency. And as you know, it's led to as far, you know, really far-reaching consequences to showing hardness approximation. 
uh, which can be done um, in a sense, you can see a lot of these proofs is analyzing the, um, the, gra the game graph. There's a game here between these two provers and the verifier. And if you look at this game graph and analyze it, you could see that uh, winning in this game can be translated to having, let's say, a large clique in this graph and so forth. And if you are talking about what is the probability of winning, that turns into asking about what is the size of the largest graph or how good can you approximate it. But we won't go there. Instead, this is all ends in 1990. Again, but in a par here is something that happens in the Berkeley campus. So we kind of bring it to today. So in a very, in really a parallel universe, as far as I'm concerned, uh, people have been talking about quantum provers. Okay, so I quantum. So the two the, those two uh, analysis closed and blocked away, they now have quantum power, and also the verifier has quantum power. And apparently there's been a long line of work, and it has been shown, somewhat disappointingly, I think, that, uh, that this doesn't add them any power. So whereas it seems like these BQP algorithms can factor or perform computations we don't know how to do on a classical computer, once you go to this proof question and let the provers, which were all powerful, also be quantum, okay, that does not add anything. Okay? So same thing that can be done interactively can be done uh, with classical provers, can be done with quantum computers. But then a fascinating question was asked by um, Dorita Aronov, uh, Michael Benor, and uh, Eban. And the question is the following. OK, let's forget the provers. Let's go back down to Earth. It's, I guess Earth in the physics department. Uh, and that is, let's, let's talk about QBP, BQP. So there is, these guys, they're not provers. They're not all powerful. They're just quantum computers that run in polynomial time. And if, in fact, these uh, QBP algorithms are computing things which we can't ver uh, verify classically, let's say they're not uh, in NP, OK, how do we even check that? So they, somebody comes, he says, I got the computers, and they work. <laughs> how do I know? I mean, how do we do the classical experiment where you know, we kind of predict what the result is, and then we can verify? We can't predict it. We don't know how to compute it ourselves. That's what we need the quantum for. So it seems to be a problem. So the question that they asked was, can interaction help you? Can a classical experimentalist or classical verifier talk to these polynomial time quantum computers and get convinced that, in fact, they are quantum, that they did co compute what they claim they did? Okay? They didn't manage to do it with a single prover. But this Berkeley campus, uh, this recent result by Weichhold, uh, Hunger, and, and Umesh, uh, shows that if there are two quantum computers, and you put them in separate rooms, so you've got to buy two. I understand even one is pretty expensive. In any case, you buy two, you separate them so they cannot communicate with each other, but they are entangled, so you add you, uh, entanglement to the model, so they get entangled before you separate them. Um, they can convince a classical verifier that they have done the computation they claim. So that, that is kind of amazing, because it's so... It, uh, I think it's, it's a beautiful idea of a new way to conduct experiments. So rather than the old scientific paradigm of you know, ver predi verifying, predicting, it's looking for an inconsistency. So if there is no inconsistency, I will accept. And what they will prove is that if the theorem is false, okay, and the quantum computation was not done, there will be an inconsistency that you will be able to catch in polynomial time. Okay, so it, it's really, I think, you know, amazing. So, no? OK. <laughs> the, um, all right, so where have we gone? We started with these polynomial time guys. OK, or Alice was not really polynomial, but polynomial time Bob. And Alice, you couldn't think of it as polynomial with a secret, doing things, in, trying to prove theorems, hiding information. We ended up with these quantum polynomial time guys trying to convince a verifier that they are actually quantum. Okay? But meanwhile, that we've been doing all this, you know, the world of computing, you know, going through these fears of, is evolved. Okay, so this gives, brings me to the last part of my talk. So it used to be that we had a big computer and there was you know, a little cloud, which was really a cloud in the sky. But uh, essentially what's happened now is that you know, computers are getting smaller. We all have these iPhones, but I was asked to close it. I was going to show it. So we all have these very, very small mobile devices that don't have necessarily room to store all our uh, data and computation, and meanwhile, the cloud has been growing. And we are told that, in fact, in the future, we just like, it would be like opening the water faucet, right? And the water is going to come out, you know, all the computational resources are going to come out from the cloud, okay? Um, so what does it have? So if you think about today, today, you know, I put my PowerPoints on the, in the cloud, so make sure that I don't lose them when I come to give the talk. And you might put some other documents 
in the cloud. Uh, but in the future, you know, we will put all our personal information there. In fact, it will be the only place the personal information will be sitting, including sort of who we are. So let's say our DNA, DNA information and so forth. So all our data is going to migrate to the cloud. And in fact, it will be the only place it sits. Now, what about computation? Again, we're going to have these very simple devices. And they're not going to be able to do all the computations we want on that data in the cloud. So also the computation is going to be done in the cloud. It's really fantastic. So Hausler was talking about sharing of information. There's fantastic possibilities here, right? All this stuff is going to be sitting in the cloud. Brave new world, enormous potential and globalization of knowledge. You know, we have all this knowledge out there. We can make computing on it. We can deduce cancer treatments and so forth. But there is a problem here. And the problem is that we have relinquished all control, right? So right now, when you put things in Dropbox, I mean, I don't know about you, I, I just put it there. You know, then I have all these MIT students who work in Dropbox. They could look at whatever I write there anytime they want, OK? And I am not worried. I should be worried. Think about it. All our computing power is there. All our data is there. Can we take advantage of this without relinquishing control? That seems totally a cryptographic challenge. And in fact, let's talk about this challenge and what we're doing about it today. And that will be the end of my talk. Um, so challenge one. Challenge one is forget about privacy. OK? Privacy, you know, we'll, um, we'll forget about that for a minute. But why do we even trust that this cloud is computing correctly? OK, why should we even trust that? Well, um, wh we won't trust it. We want to verify that. So this is what we call delegating computation. We've given our cloud the ability to compute for us, but we now we want to trust but check what they give us back, OK? And uh, that seems to be very close to what we've been talking about, right? Proofs. Except these days, what, what I'm suggesting here, or what people have suggested here, is the cloud is going to not just compute, but it compute and prove. Okay? So proving is going to be an integral part of computing in the cloud. Every computation is going to be accompanied with some kind of a proof that the computation was done correctly. Now, obviously, this proof, it's got to be the case that checking this proof has got to have to be much, much faster than computing. Because otherwise, what did I need the cloud for? OK, so somehow that has to be the case. The cloud is doing a lot of work. My checking has to be extremely fast. Excellent. Didn't we just show that PSpace, uh, you know, we can do incredible computations. The proof could be PSpace computation. And the verify just have to be polynomial time. So it seems like we've solved the problem with interactive proofs. The problem here is. So what's the language here in interactive proofs is that x is equal, f of x is equal to y. The problem is that if you really did look at those proofs, what happens there is they work wonderfully when there's a, this huge gap between p space and polynomial time. But if actually the computation you're doing was in polynomial time to begin with, they don't work so well. In particular, this theorem says that if your algorithm that the cloud is doing took s space, say, then it will take the prover 2 to the polynomial in s time to prove you the correctness of a statement. Now, this prover, he's the cloud, he's powerful, he does not have exponential amount of time. Okay? So the challenge now is how do we actually prove, uh, maybe using interactive proofs or some other uh, two prover proofs or whatever, in such a way, so we want to delegate the proof of the result of a polynomial time computation where the prover doesn't work much more than it took him to compute. Okay? So he has to be really relatively efficient to his computation, and this guy has to be super efficient, not polynomial time. He should be really linear time, maybe even less than linear time. So that's the question. Can you use this whole interaction with this all-powerful prover to actually do this specific concrete task, which is verify computations which are done in the cloud? This is a very, very active research area. So I summarize in a table because I realize I don't have time to go through each result. And if you, there's really tons of papers here. Uh, and I have only referenced three. So why did I choose these three? They really to see that there are different models that people look at. One model is just the interactive proof. Okay, so no assumptions on the, on the prover. We're saying any strategy of the prover, I trust after we go through the interactive proof. And in such a case, we can in fact show that as long as the circuit that's computing uh, the program has depth D, we can be convinced in D rounds of communication and taking s slightly less, more than linear time to verify. Okay? Then, if you're willing to make computational assumptions, like uh, uh, I won't exactly go into what they are, you can do much better than that. So you can take any Turing machine of time T. This is a new result by Yael Kalai, Ran, Ran Raz, and, uh, and Ran in and Ron Rothblum, they are indistinguishable, the Rothblums. And um, not really, but uh, for the purpose of the slide. Uh, um, and they show that take any Turing machine that runs in time t, then a prover can work in time 
essentially a little bit more than t, and uh, convince a verifier who just runs in quasi-linear time, okay, and, log, and polynomial in logarithmic of t. So verifying is really log of computing that it was computed correctly. Uh, and then at the another, if you make sort of stronger assumptions, you can actually talk about non-deterministic time and not just Turing machine model, but random access model, which is much more the way that we actually compute. And in fact, um, um, so this is Guy and Yael. And uh, in fact, there's another line of work, which is Avi Vigderson, Guy, and, and Salil, where they said, you know what? These days, who has time even to look at X? We're talking about big data. X is this huge amount of data. The verifier doesn't have time to look at the whole thing. So what we want, let's say, is a sublinear algorithm. So we want to be able to check computation without even the verifier looking at the input. Of course, we were not going to get exact answers. We will get what we call approximate answers, I won't, uh, which means that they're close to exact in some formal sense. And they can show how to do that as well in this new work, which is going to appear in uh, stock, I understand. Now, this last bullet just says that all of this is not just theory. It turns out that there is actually practical efforts, OK? So there are programmers who know how to write programs and are writing programs to take these results and translate them to real systems. There's a paper in crypto this year that shows how to implement an implementation. How do you prove the results of C programs? And that needs the RAM model. So it's very interesting to see how far this will go. And when it will make, I mean, something will make its way into real systems. And the question is how long that's going to take. All right, so challenge two, uh, my last challenge. Challenge two is privacy. After all, this zero knowledge, the point why they introduce it. I wanted to prove your theorem so that you believe it, but you find out nothing else, OK? Now, in the cloud, I'm putting all my data there. That's it, you know? I want the cloud to compute for me. But what about the privacy of my data? So encryption, you know, right? We need everything's going to be encrypted. Of course, as soon as everything is encrypted, how is the cloud going to do the computation? He wants to compute f of x, but x is encrypted. So what we need is to add an encryption scheme where there's both privacy and functionality. Somehow, given e of x, we can compute on x without actually knowing what it is. Um, and uh, that's exactly the next challenge. Encryption comes back. Encryption of the result returns. Right? Somehow, the cloud is able to compute on x without decrypting and finding out what it is. So now, it turns out that this question, uh, whether this is doable, uh, has a name. It's called fully homomorphic encryption. Is it possible for any computation f to do this? Is there an encryption scheme that supports that? So this question was asked by Rivest, Adelman, and uh, de Tussos 30 years ago. It's more than 30 years. Uh, 30 five years ago, 35 years ago. And apparently, when they asked it, at least that's what uh, Adelman claims, I just met him a couple days ago, is it was to say that this is impossible. But you know, cryptography has a way to surprise us. Often, these things that seem to be impossible actually uh, are possible. And uh, there was uh, this uh, famous result by Craig Gentry from Stanford, who showed how to do this. So he exhibited a method based on some assumptions on difficulty of some problems on lattices uh, to do this fully homomorphic encryption. And uh, some, this impossible seeming task, okay, which was first shown possible under some assumption in 2009, has since have had sort of lots of work and uh, the, the most uh, efficient and also based on much weaker assumptions is by Brakursky and Vika and Nathan in 2011. So wonderful, we can compute on encrypted data. Are we done? Uh, no, of course. So this is, of co is a hail tool, a fantastic tool for computing on encrypted data. But does it really solve everything we want to solve? And uh, I wouldn't ask that question I, um, if I didn't have uh, an answer. And so I'm claiming, no, it is not enough. Okay? Why is it not enough? What are some things we might want to do that we cannot do with fully homomorphic encryption? So I claim that this is not enough if this uh, cloud, which we can think of the evaluator of the function, needs to know the result. Okay, so it needs to know the result of the computation. Uh, and uh, this does not give it to me, right? So fully homomorphic encryption, I send encrypted data, I get back encrypted result, so the arrows are going the wrong way. Uh, right, this last error should go, the whole thing is the wrong way. Yeah, so just switch them in your mind. Uh, the arrows are the other way. So I'm sending encrypted data, I'm getting back encrypted result. But the cloud might need to actually know the result. Encrypted result is not good enough. Why would that be the case? So here are three examples where that would be necessary. So first example is, let's say that this um, 
this is the mobile device over there. Uh, so let's say that this guy, he uh, has encrypt everybody sends him encrypted email. How many people in this audience use encrypted email? Wow, that's more than my cryptography class at MIT. Um, OK, in any case, let's say in the future we all use encrypted email. OK, we all use encrypted email. And uh, we want to be able to run it through a spam filter so that uh, the ones who are spam will be junked and we never have to look at them. OK, so, that, so we let the cloud uh, ask him to run our spam filter on us. The thing is, wonderful, they run the spam filter on an encrypted data, and they found out that this is spam. But they didn't. They found encrypted the word spam. So now they give it to me so that I can decrypt and find out it's spam. What's the point? I want the, the cloud to do the work, okay? So we want the spam filter to be able to tell that this email was spam, even though he didn't, wasn't able to read it. So I want to be able to know the result of the computation, which is this email must be junked, okay? Now, how do we do that? Well, we could give the spam the key, the secret key, but then he could read all my data. But that's not a good idea. We could, uh, talk, we could have the, the spam filter talk to me, but I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to, I, that's why I don't want to read the spam. So it will not work. What we need, really, is a way to be able to find out the result of the computation not, uh, without decrypting the message. What's another thing? So you know the cameras are everywhere. Okay? So there's surveillance cameras uh, everywhere you go. Okay? And uh, you know, it's a little bit of a problem, right? Because we, we need these cameras, but on the other hand, you know, the whole idea of privacy and sort of civil liberties in contradiction with this. So suppose in the future there was a law that all surveillance cameras would only produce encrypted photos, okay? But then what's the point of having the camera to begin with, okay? Well, the point is, wouldn't it be nice if we could go to a suspect database and evaluate the filter to see whether in that photo there is a suspect without actually looking at the photo? All we want to know is when there is a, a suspect in there that we have tagged that photograph, okay? And it, maybe even who the suspect is. Uh, how do we do it? So I want to run through this thing. At the end, I want to say, I want to have the result. I want to say, yes, no, there's a suspect in this picture or not without having to look at the picture. Okay. A, what's a third example that's possible? So again, we want to know he appears in the scene without seeing the picture. A third example is motivated by the talk of Hausler yesterday. Say there's a medical, he says that people don't want to share their data. Okay? And that's a problem, because we need sharing of data. Now, uh, suppose that we want to conduct a medical study on this confidential co medical information. So uh, there's a laboratory, they have all the data encrypted. Okay? They might be willing to share their data, uh, or let, but not fully. They want to, so could, wouldn't it be nice if they would give you the data in such a way that you could run your medical study that they approved, but that's it. So you would find out the results of medical study and then maybe decide to do some new drug treatment, but you haven't found out my entire medical profile. Okay. So all this sounds, again, very futuristic. How can I encrypt and still let you have the ability to compute something, but not everything? If you think about zero knowledge in some sense, what did we do there? I want you to convince you the correctness of a proof with giving you nothing. Now I want to give you the a result of a computation, but give you nothing else. Okay? So it turns out okay, that there is this amazing uh, uh, tool called functional encryption. What's functional encryption? Well, I like the name filterable decryption, because we want to, sort of uh, well, to, uh, to be allowed to decrypt through a filter. Okay? And this is a li long line of work, but I think that this exact fo uh, formulation appeared in a paper by Bonet, Sahai, and Waters in 2011. So what this system does is the following. I'm still, I'm still sending my encrypted data, okay? But I want you to be able to run some computations on X, which you will find out what the result are. They could be a profiling, they could be a medical study, they could be whatever. The idea is then, I that they suggest is maybe it's possible for me to give you a special key, not a key that will enable you to decrypt the entire data, just the key, SK sub F, that will enable you to run F on X. So at the end, you'll find out the result of F of X, but nothing else, okay? So somehow for every function, let's say there would be a special key that enables you to run that computation, find out that result about X, but nothing else, okay? So incredible question. How would you even define security here? Again, you would use sort of a simulation type argument. So that is, you want to say that this cloud, he gets this secret key that enables him to do the computation. He can do that, but nothing else. So as far as the cloud is concerned, whether he sees your encrypted data or not, he's in the same situation. 
And so they asked the question whether it's possible. There's been a really long line of work showing that it's possible for particular kind of functions, or it's possible if you are willing for the encryptions to be extremely large, which kind of makes it uh, not that interesting because it means that the mobile person and the cloud work the same amount, which was not the reason why we wanted to cloud to begin with. But this is my last slide, really. There is a paper in, uh, in uh, stock that uh, Raluca Pupa is going to uh, describe, which is a new functional encryption scheme, or filterable decryption, as I like to call it, that can solve these problems. So you can show how to do this for any component time function f, so how to give you the ability to compute it. And the encryption scheme at the end has ciphertexts, which are what we call succinct. So they are short. If, if the size of the computation is s and the depth is d, is the size d. Anyway, those are already technical details. But it means that we can solve the examples that I discuss. Now, we are not done. There are tons. I mean, I, I am done. Don't worry. But, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there are many, many more questions that uh, we, we ask. And some of them we can solve. Some of them people are still working on. For example, Hausler talked about the fact that we could be able to talk, we want to share data across providers, across the world. So in the language here, it would be encrypted data by different keys, doing sort of aggregate type of computations. All this very much subject of active research. And um, what does that mean? Let's go back to the beginning. The title of my talk is The Cryptographic Lens. So there's sort of two takeaway messages. First of all is that I think that our expectation for what is possible for digital privacy, it's very important, it really should not be bound to what we kind of experience in the physical world. So with digital information, you can do pretty amazing things, which we, we have to sort of free ourselves from thinking about what can be done physically. And second of all, um, you know, I think the more fascinating question maybe for people sort of younger in the audience or sort of graduate students is, okay, we're doing this research, there are new methods, so the encryption now is based on methods from lattices, not from number theory. It is this computing on this representation of data in encrypted form. How are these uh, techniques and notions affect maybe uh, complexity theory of tomorrow? And um, I'm sure they will. I have some ideas even. But uh, I think it's, uh, if the history tells us anything for the future, it's going to be interesting. Thank you.